Welcome back. This is Heart Physiology Part 3. Once we, the basic rhythm is set, the body can modify it. This is known as extrinsic innervation of the heart. The autonomic nervous system modifies our heartbeat via cardiac centers in the medulla. The cardio acceleratory center sends signals through the sympathetic trunk to increase both rate and force. It stimulates the SA and the AV nodes, heart muscle, and coronary arteries. The cardio inhibitory center sends parasympathetic, parasympathetic signals via the vagus nerve to decrease the rate. It inhibits the SA and the AV nodes via vagus nerves. Figure 1814 depicts both the cardio acceleratory and the cardio inhibitory centers. Remember, this is how our bodies modify the basic heart rate. Make sure you take a look at this in your text. So the purple here are the parasympathetic neurons. They're going from the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus down this, um, the cardio inhibitory pathway to the SA and the AV nodes. The sympathetic neurons go from the sympathetic truck down to the SA and the AV nodes and the, uh, the myocardium. So we have discussed the intrinsic cardiac conduction system and how it allows for controlled action potentials to occur in different areas of the heart. Next, we will discuss how these action potentials cause coordinated heart contractions of the heart of the cardiac muscle. Contractile muscle fibers make up the bulk of the heart and are responsible for causing the heart's pumping action. Cardiac muscle contractions are different from skeletal muscle contractions. Cardiac muscle contractions, I'm sorry, cardiac muscle action potentials have plateaus. Let's discuss the steps involved in a contractile cardiac muscle action potential. First, depolarization occurs when the fast voltage-gated sodium channels open. Sodium enters the cell, leading to the rising phase of the action potential from negative 90 millivolts to positive 30 millivolts. So as it seems to be with the other action potentials we talked about, the first thing that happens is the sodium channels open. <clears throat> The second step is at positive 30 millivolts, the sodium channels close, but slow calcium channels open, prolonging the depolarization. This is seen as a plateau. Lastly, after about 200 milliseconds, slow calcium channels close and the voltage-gated potassium channels open. This results in a rapid efflux of potassium outside of the cell. So remember, we have high potassium levels inside the cell, and when we open these channels, the potassium leaves. This causes the, um, the voltage of the cell to decrease. This is the repolarization. Also, calcium is pumped both back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and out of the cell into the extracellular space. The difference between cardiac muscle fiber and skeletal muscle fiber contractions are twofold. First, the action potential in skeletal muscle lasts about 1 to 2 milliseconds, whereas in cardiac muscle, it lasts about 200 milliseconds. So, the action potential is much longer in cardiac muscle. Secondly, a contraction in skeletal muscle lasts about 15 to 100 milliseconds, whereas in cardiac conduction, or in a cardiac contraction, lasts over 200 milliseconds. Again, the heart takes much longer to contract. The benefit of cardiac's longer action potential and contraction include that sustained contractions ensures efficient ejection of blood. Additionally, a longer refractory period in the cardiac cells prevents tetanic contractions. Those are the sustained contractions from rapid action potential frequencies. We talked about that in skeletal muscle. Figure 18.15 further explains the action potential of the contractile cardiac muscle cells. 
Visually, their action potentials are very different from what we have seen previously. It starts off low and then goes straight up. We have no ramping up, it's just immediately straight up. And then decreases to a plateau. So let's go through it. First, we see the depolarization due to a sodium influx through fast voltage-gated sodium channels. That's what's causing this huge increase. A positive feedback cycle rapidly opens many sodium channels, reversing the membrane potential. And that's why it's a, um, a straight up line. The channel inactivation of the fast voltage gated sodium channels ends this phase. So once those get closed off, it ends it here. The second part is the plateau phase. This is caused by calcium ion influx through slow calcium channels. This keeps the cell depolarized because most sodium channels are closed. So instead of falling immediately down, we have a plateau because of these calcium channels being open. Repolarization is the third phase. That's this down here. It's due to the calcium channels inactivating and the sodium channels opening. This allows the sodium efflux, which brings the membrane potential back down to its resting voltage. We often see it tends to be that the uh, potassium channels are the last thing in any of these action potentials. So it's usually sodium, then we have the calcium, and sometimes the calcium helps with a further increase, but in this case it's just preventing a falling down. And then we have the sodium channels. This chart summarizes the differences between a cardiac action potential and a skeletal muscle action potential. <clears throat> Pacemaker cells initiate the impulse in a cardiac action potential, whereas the nervous system stimulations initiates the action potential in skeletal muscle. In the heart, gap junctions tie cardiac cells together to form what is called a functional syncytium. This is a good vocabulary word to know. This means that the heart works, that the heart works as a single unit. In the skeletal muscles, <clears throat> Their muscle cells are stimulated individually by the nervous system. In the cardiac action potentials, there are two, there is a two-step calcium ion influx. First, from depolarization, then there's an influx from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In skeletal muscle, action potentials, the depolarization wave across the muscle fiber releases enough calcium for the contraction. Tetanus is not possible in cardiac cells because the action potential and cardiac contraction are nearly the same length. Tetanus of skeletal muscle is possible because its absolutely re absolute refractory period is shorter than the contraction, so there's a difference there. In the heart, ATP is supplied aerobically, which is a great dependence on oxygen. On the other hand, in skeletal muscle, ATP is supplied aerobically and anaerobically. Next, we move into the mechanical events of the heart. Systole is the period of the heart contraction. Diastole is a period of heart relaxation. I try to remember this. Um, I know this is kind of weird, but I think of like diastole as like you're dying and therefore you're relaxed. So that's how I remember systole. And then um, I remember just that diastole is the relaxation because when you're dead, you're pretty relaxed. The cardiac cycle is how the blood flows through the heart during one complete heartbeat. Atrial systole and diastole are followed by ventricular systole and diastole. The cardiac cycle represents a series of pressure and blood volume changes. Mechanical events follow the electrical events seen on an ECG. There are three phases of the cardiac cycle, starting with total relaxation. First, there is ventricular filling during the mid to late diastole, 
So think about that. Diastole is relaxation. When the heart's relaxed, the ventricles um, are getting filled with blood from the atria. During this time, blood pressure is low. 80% of the blood passively flows from the atria through open atrioventricular valves into the ventricle. The semilunar valves are closed at this time. Atrial depolarization triggers atrial systole, or the P wave. So once there's a depolarization, there's going to be a contraction, um, which is considered the P wave, or we see that as the P wave. Then the atria contract, pushing the remaining 20% of the blood into the ventricle. The end diastolic volume, or EDV, is the volume of blood in each, each ventricle at the end of ventricular diastole. So think about that. After the ventricles contract, there's still some blood floating around in there that didn't all get pushed out. So that's end diastolic volume. Depolarization spreads to the ventricles, creating the QR wave. The atria finish contracting and return to diastole while the ventricles begin systole. The second part of the cardiac cycle is ventricular systole. When the atria relax and the ventricles begin to contract. Rising ventricular pressure causes the closing of the AV valves. There are two phases. First, in the isovolumetric contraction phase, all valves are closed. Second, in the ejection phase, the ventricular pressure exceeds pressure in large arteries, forcing the semilunar valves open so that the blood can either go into uh, the pulmonary artery or to the body through the aorta. The pressure in the aorta is around 120 millimeters of mercury, which you may recognize as the systolic pressure of one's blood pressure. The end systolic volume, ESV, is the volume of blood remaining in each ventricle after systole. The last part of the cardiac cycle is the isovolumetric relaxation and early diastole. Following ventricular repolarization, which is the T wave, the ventricles are relaxed and the atria are relaxed and filling. The backflow of blood in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk closes the semilunar valves. This causes the dichrotic notch, which is a brief rise in the aortic pressures as blood rebounds off of, closed, off of the closed valves. The ventricles are totally closed chambers at this point. When atrial pressure exceeds ventricular pressure, the AV valves open and the cycle begins again. This is a fantastic figure summarizing the events of the cardiac cycle. Please be sure to study this figure in your books and be able to explain the events occurring. The top of the figure illustrates the ECG tracing. We see the P, QRS, and the T waves. Here we can see where the P wave corresponds to atrial depolarization. So if we come down here, um, we have atrial systole right there. So remember um, that systole is the contraction. We also see here we have ventricular filling when it's just relaxed, but then um, we're going to have an atrial contraction occurring. The ventricular volume increases during this time because blood is forced into the ventricles from the atria. So after the contraction, it keeps going up. The QRS complex includes the time of atrial repolarization and ventricular depolarization. So we see at the bottom here the ventricular systole phase. See, ventricular systole phase. And that's all occurring in 2A and then 2B. So we look up here, 2A, that's the QRS time. Blood is being forced from the ventricles and the ventricular volume decreases. So during this 2A, 2B part, we see the ventricular volume and then it decreases. T is the ventricular repolarization, which corresponds with the early diastole 
of the cardiac cycle. So that's when we have 